Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This is episode 231. Yeah, we talk with Ronnie Lee. He, he really shouldn't need an introduction, but in case you do need an introduction. I mean, he's a former political prisoner. Former political prisoner. Uh, was in a group called the Band of Mer- Mercy, mm-hmm. which then later transformed into the Animal Liberation Front. Um, he coined the name Animal Liberation Front. Um, he was the first press officer. Um, just a hugely influential activist uh, that we still see that influence taking place today. Uh, love love this conversation he's just the sweetest guy in the world so in lieu of uh, our side this week we're just gonna give you the episode in its entirety yeah unedited here you go so sit back revel in a little revolution Well, I just want to say up front, um, I'm honestly a little nervous. Uh, you're you kind of have had a huge influence in my life. Like pretty much everything that's influenced me has has a direct correlation back to you in so many different ways. So, thank you. Oh, I'm <laughs> I'm very pleased. <laughs> I'm honoured <laughs> to hear that. That's great. <laughs> and likewise from my <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's uh, I, I'm pleased if you know if I can influence people. I'm I'm hoping that I can still do that, and I'm hoping that the the book will do that um, because I kind of one of the things I worry about with the book is that it will just be used as a kind of spectacle. That it will be something that people will read and think, "Oh, that was a good book, and that was interesting, that was exciting, or whatever," and that they won't kind of take it as an encouragement to become active themselves that's 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 the the worry i have with it i i i you know, i do feel pretty confident it will encourage people to to become active in campaigning for veganism and animal liberation but it does worry me a little bit that it'll be just another uh, another excuse for people to be spectators instead of activists and you have just been at a veg fest all day today, right? No, I wasn't at a veg fest. Um, myself and my wife Louise went to Birmingham. There was a protest there against the government. You know, we have a conservative government which just managed to be elected mm. uh, about a week ago. And um, we want them out for lots of different reasons, social justice reasons, also for animal protection, because they're, they're not good for animals in lots of different ways. Whereas the guy, the guy that would form a government if they weren't there, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, he, he's a vegetarian. He's very sympathetic to animals as, as well, being, being very good on social justice. So we took part in that demonstration today. Uh, we, we took the opportunity to give out a lot of leaflets encouraging people to be vegan uh, on on the demonstration, so we were kind of doing doing two things at once there. But there were a lot of other events on today. Um, there was another vegan event in Birmingham. There was a, a, a an anti duty section event there, and other events throughout the country. I mean, we have several vegan festivals really every weekend here now in in uh, in the UK, and things are, are really going in the right direction now. What what do you think causes the the lack of that level here in the United States that we just don't seem to to get? It, it may just be time. It, it it took quite some while for that to to build up over here. So, certainly in terms of of uh, vegan campaigning, I mean, vegan campaigning over here has only maybe been been going about fifteen years. I mean. For a long time before, people campaigned for animal rights and for animal protection, but there was there was no real um, effort to promote veganism, and that's uh, over here. You know, that's 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 fairly that is fairly recent, even. And and so I think that it could be just that the, the USA is a, a you know a bit behind 
um, the UK in that, and that that can happen. But it's really a question of people over there making it happen, you know, getting out there and educating the public. And then, you know, once the ball starts rolling, you'll probably find that, that more people will join in and get active as well. That's one thing I have noticed throughout the years is that uh, me, myself as an activist, has always kind of looked over the pond as kind of like the guideline. So, I mean, even back before Shaq and then going through the Shaq days, it was always like, we, you know, well, look at the crazy shit they're doing. Why can't we step up our game mm-hmm. to the same level? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, I, I kind of don't necessarily think that. Um, that's that's the only way to go. I mean, Shaq, I think Shaq um, did make an important contribution to the campaign against uh, vivisection. And I think they they did, although they didn't succeed in, in closing hunting licenses, which was the aim, I think there was a kind of spin-off in terms of putting pressure on the, um, the vivisection industry as a whole, which which resulted in there being less animal experiments than there otherwise would have been. So, so that campaign, even though the, the main aim wasn't achieved, I, I certainly don't regard that campaign as as having failed overall. Um, but there's lots of you know there's lots of ways of 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 campaigning for animals, and it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of militant type campaign. I think education is really important. You know, educating people to go vegan. Is abs- is absolutely vital because that's 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 really fundamental. If we're going to challenge species, even it's, it's a really fundamental thing to do to educate people to go vegan, and anyone can do that. I mean, one thing we, we do a lot locally, we we just put flyers through 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 people's letter boxes, um, uh, and, and and we have an aim. We've got a guy who's got a map of the town on his wall, and and our aim is eventually to cover every uh, deliver a leaflet to every household in the town and that's something that's like anyone can do as as, as long as they can walk and, and hold some flyers they can do that you know um and 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 that that can educate a lot of people you know to to to, to go vegan and, and it's a very simple thing that that almost anyone can do how have you seen like your own personal uh views on tactics kind of change throughout the years as have you gone through and maybe gone through more maturity and things like that? I think it's become uh, it's through becoming aware of how how ordinary people operate in 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 one in one way, and also um, kind of thinking more about the, um, the, the 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 causes and the reasons for why um, uh, animals are exploited and persecuted. Um, and, and and also, I mean, there's a kind of historical aspect to it as well. In that, if you go back to the um, the seventies, when I suppose the animal rights movement as such a, 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 arose over here, there'd been a tradition really up until then of of, of people campaigning against all sorts of, of of animal abuse, but but not campaigning. For veganism, you know, there are organisations against vivisection and against the fur trade, against animals in circuses and zoos and all those things. Um, but there wasn't um, the the, the organisations that promoted veganism, um, mainly the Vegan Society. They they weren't really a campaigning organisation. There was an organisation that existed, you know, to help to help vegans to give advice to vegans. And so I think when when campaigning became more militant with the Animal Liberation Front and and, and similar groups, it tended to it tended to kind of follow the same pattern. In other words, that there was a big focus on um, animal experimentation and um, places involved in that, and also on the fur trade, a big focus on that. And although there were some actions taken against the, the meat industry, for instance, that, that tended not really to be the main focus of campaigning. And I think this was there's a historical reason for that that came out of how things were were previously. And of course, then eventually, for various reasons, that 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 type of you know militant activity died away. Lots of different reasons for that. And then, as I said, maybe uh, about 15 years ago, the, the, the idea of campaigning 
for veganism started to get a hold we had people starting to organize vegan fairs people to start doing outreach on the streets leafleting holding street stores and that kind of thing that and that gradually grew up and you know i see that as, as, as a really important development because i think if we're going to um we're going to achieve animal liberation. We have to change the way that a very large number of people think and the, the way that those people behave. You know, it has to be, a, a lot of people have to change. And the way to do that really is 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 mainly through education. I mean, I th- think politics has a has a part a role to play as well but i think educate unless we have the education first then we're not going to get very far and and i think what happened with the alf is 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 the alf kind of ignored ordinary people it was like this this war that was going on directly against the animal abusers you know it was the establishments of animal abuse that were being attacked and and you know in in many ways, it's a very positive thing. You know, animal liberation from actions um, saved thousands of animals from slaughter and suffering. I mean, it, it was a major reason why the, the, the fur industry um, in the UK was decimated. It was, it's, it, you know, we still have uh, places over here selling fur coats and other garments containing fur. But it's very, very much smaller than it was um, Back in the seventies and eighties, and and a, a big reason for that is is ALF activity. So there's a, you know there's a lot of positives about that type of activity, um, but it didn't it bypassed ordinary people. It didn't educate ordinary people. You see, and and, and unless we educate a large number of ordinary people, we're not really going to get widespread. We're not going to get widespread animal liberation, and so that and that's why it's from kind of thinking about these things more, uh, thinking about tactics and thinking about strategy that I've I've come to that conclusion. So, so you, you mentioned like the, the ALF and the activities in the seventies. When when those activities were going on, did you ever? think that in the united states the the director of the fbi would cause call the animal liberation front the greatest domestic terrorism threat no at the beginning i didn't of course when we when we started um i mean the, the animal liberation front was originally called the band of mercy and there was a group of six of us we we had a meeting in um i think it was 19, 1973 um we, we went to a, a cafe in London, this basement cafe in London, and we were huddled in a table in the corner discussing what we were going to do. And we were people who were involved, you know, already involved in uh, groups like the Hunt Saboteurs. We were already involved in kind of some form of direct action. And we talked about, you know, t- going a step further and um, taking action against property, a- a- actually doing stuff that was against the law and we 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 said to ourselves then that this was a a big gamble we didn't know what would happen we didn't know uh whether or not this would spread we hoped it would spread and that other people would would take it up but we 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 didn't know whether anyone else apart from the six of us sat around that table would actually get involved and so it kind of, <laughs> it, it was kind of in a sense a, 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 pleasant, a pleasant surprise to see how much the ALF did spread and, and became active in many other countries in the world and, and also spread in, in the UK as well. Uh, I, to be honest, uh, that decision led to me be going to my very first protest even. It's, it's crazy to think that that's kind of like the the, the breadth of the downward momentum that those those actions created oh yes it kind it got, it got i mean what happened was that the um uh there were a couple of us that were involved in the the band of mercy activities because because the band of mercy changed its name to the alf in 1976 because the the name band of mercy didn't say anything about animals and people some people thought it was some kind of religious group the name actually arose from from an RSPCA youth group that operated in the 19th century, who who were actually very militant and you know did things like damage guns that people used to shoot animals, that kind of thing. So we wanted to revive the spirit of that, but the name didn't say what what we were about, and and that's why it was changed to the Animal Liberation Front, to, you know, to make it clear what 
what we stood for. Um, but the, the early Band of Mercy actions, a, a couple of us were, were, were put in prison um, for that, and we, we spent a year in a year in jail. And during that sentence, I really thought that everything had come to an end because it, it did scare off some people. Some of the other people that were in, in the original six people, some of those people never never took action again because of the sentence that that, that a couple of us received. Um, and and I I was worried that that was the end of it. But when I when I actually came out of prison. I found that there were a, a lot of people wanting to get involved. You know, a lot of, you know, many young people were really key, were coming up to me and saying, "I want, I want to do this. I want to do what you did and, and get involved." And so there was this. It, it grew really quite rapidly from that. And it was it, once again that was a very pleasant surprise for me to to come out of jail and have all these people so keen, you know, to to to, to get involved in that sort of action. So you mentioned like that was your your first uh, prison experience. Would you mind going into like what was it like actually going into prison for the very first time? Well, I'd had I'd kind of had some experience what prison was like because my um, I, I previously worked before becoming involved, you know, with with uh, direct action for animals. I, I'd I'd worked in a, in a in a lawyer's office and I'd gone to visit. Uh, people in prison, you know, as part of that job. So I kind of was aware of what, you know, the interior of a prison was like, <laughs> although from it's kind of from the other side. Um, so it wasn't a totally strange experience, but nevertheless, it's, it, you know, it wasn't a pleasant experience. Um, but I think, you know, I gained strength from the fact that that I didn't consider myself to be a, 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 a criminal, that I hadn't done anything wrong and that I was you know I I was I was there for, for good reasons you know I think that that gave me strength um, I mean as far as being a vegan in prison it was it wasn't that easy in the early days to, to get a decent vegan diet in fact I went on um, when, when I was sentenced um, the first time um, to imprisonment I, I actually went on hunger strike to, to get a decent vegan diet because basically they, they recognize vegetarians if someone said there was a vegetarian they were a vegetarian they were entitled to a vegetarian diet of course there were a lot of animal products still in that eggs and cheese and um when i said i was a vegan they said oh well you'll just have to take what you can out of the vegetarian diet so so there was no substitute for the, for the animal products you, 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 basically i was just having to eat the vegetables and so after i'd been on hunger strike for about 10 days they did the, the the guy that was in charge of the kitchen prison officer that was in charge of the kitchen came to see me and said okay you know we, we we've decided that we're going to give you <laughs> a vegan diet and he discussed with me what they could do you know what it was that i would eat and what they could provide and it wasn't great i mean they, they didn't want to spend a great deal of money on it but it was it was it was a it was acceptable, you know. It was nutritionally okay. So so that was you know that kind of in, that did improve things a bit. And then of course I I I I, I had two more prison sentences after that, and each time the the, the vegan diet got better. <laughs> So, and, and and I think a, a, a big reason for that was the the vegan society um, took it on as a campaign to 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 actually get a proper vegan diet um, in in prisons, and they 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 had a lot of um, correspondence with prison authorities and did a lot of campaigning. Um, and and massively improved and massively improved the, the vegan diet in in prison through that. And then uh, later on, that that work was taken over by a group called the Vegan Prisoner Support Group, and they carried on the, the work, work that the Vegan Society had had done to 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 improve the vegan diet in prison. What it's like now, I I don't know because of course I I came out of prison in. Um, 1992 so that's really quite a long time ago so i'm not too aware of 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 
of how the vegan diet is in prison, but certainly it did improve um, greatly, really, um, during the time during the time I was in jail. I actually kind of find that a little shocking. Like even just last year in the United States, the federal prisons finally recognized a vegan mm -hmm. meal plan, and people still aren't getting it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's sort of an indication of, you know, the, the fact that USA is is behind the UK in these things. But yeah. but it does also show that that that's happening. Okay, it's there's still a lot to a, a lot of work to be done, and and uh, you know, some way to go down the road. But um, it does seem well, the vegan diet's actually been recognised there and all right that's that vegan diet was recognized over here probably it would have been probably in the early eight in the early 80s because it was kind of before then it was just a case of if you were a vegan and you were in prison you had to kind of campaign yourself um what i achieved for me in terms of a vegan diet wasn't then applied to all vegan prisoners and and some another vegan going you know to another jail for instance wouldn't that ruling that they they gave for me wouldn't have applied to that person and they'd have had their own their own battle to get a vegan diet whereas in the in in the um in, in the uh, 80s certainly early to mid 80s it did be, become accepted that if if a person was a member of the vegan, you had to be a member of the vegan society and have a membership card for the vegan society. <laughs> and if you had, if you were a card carrying member of the vegan society, you were entitled to a vegan diet. And the vegan society membership increased greatly because a lot of ordinary prisoners that weren't, you know, that weren't ethical vegans, because the vegan diet was better. It was more, you know, more nutritious than the the ordinary prison diet. A lot of non-vegans thought, well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'd, I'd rather have a vegan diet in prison, so I'll join the vegan society. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, they had all these prisoners join the vegan society, and their membership really swelled because of it. Um, but now it's 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 moved on from that, and you don't have to be a member of the vegan society now. If if you, you when, when you enter prison, if you say you're a vegan, then you get a vegan diet. So, and that's on par with 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 people that are vegetarian. It's it's on par par with religious groups, such as people who are Jews or, or or Muslims. They're entitled to special diets in accordance with their religion, and that, they don't have to have a have a a letter from the rabbi or from the imam proving that they're of that religion or a membership card. They just say that they are and they get the diet. And um, same with vegetarians. And now it's the same now with, with vegans as well. Thankfully, there's like equal equal recognition of veganism as a as given, you know, people a right to that diet. So that that's that's where, the you know, where there's been this, this gradual in, improvement over here. Do you feel comfortable talking about what led up to that first prison sentencing? Oh, 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 oh yes. I, I mean, basically, um, after we'd had that meeting of the six of us, we 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 started to get active. And the first thing we we did, because um, almost all of us had um, were involved with with the hunt saboteurs, our first target was were, were the hunts. And what we would do, we would go to the the hunt kennels, you know, their headquarters where they had dogs, uh, they had all their vehicles, and we we'd cause damage to their vehicles to stop them going out hunting the next day. We'd do it in the early hours of the morning of the day they were due to go out hunting <laughs> to you know to, to to try to stop them, and that was you know that was that was our first target. And then we we heard about um, a vivisection laboratory that was being built where they were going to do experiments on animals involving radiation and uh, so we decided right you know we'll uh, <laughs> we'll see what we can do about this place and so on a couple of occasions we we waited until the, all the all the builders or all, all the, uh, the 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 guys that were involved in build building the place we waited till they'd gone so that so it was empty uh, it's basically a construction site, and then we we made two attempts to burn the place down, um, 
which didn't succeed, didn't succeed in burning the place down. Simply, there wasn't really enough in the building at that stage that, that was flammable, really. But it did do, it did do something in tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage to to the place. Um, but eventually we got, um, um, we, 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 we were um, convicted uh, or, or, or we, we, we were charged by the police with, um, with with doing that and kind of how that happened really was that we we then embarked on a campaign of targeting uh, places that supplied animals to laboratories because they were an easy easier target than the laboratories themselves because the laboratories themselves tended to have you know security on them because they, they were probably because there was valuable equipment inside whereas the people that bred and supplied the animals to laboratories, they, they didn't, they had little or no security on their premises. Um, and we, we mainly targeted their vehicles, the vehicles they used to take the animals to the laboratories. We, we would damage the vehicles. Sometimes we burn them, sometimes we do other damage to them. And we also um, attacked two, two small fishing boats that we used to kill baby seals. Um, there, there, there was this killing of baby seals in a particular part of um, England it's called, it's on, on the um, on, on the east coast, a place called the Wash, where there's a seal colony. And every year, these these um, fishermen would go and and uh, shoot the seals, and they'd use these these small fishing boats as kind of mother vessels and launch inflate inflatable dinghies to go and shoot the seals and so we attacked two of their two, two of the, the fishing boats they used one was destroyed and the other one was damaged and that's never taken place again uh, it's never taken place again since then um uh, that that was that 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 was a major factor. Our attack on those was a major factor in actually stopping that, uh, and that was in 1974. And it's uh, and that that actually helped put an end to that that killing of seals that was taking place every year. Um, and and as I said, we then went on to attack the places that bred and supplied the animal laboratories. And we actually we actually got caught on one of these places, and um, they they managed to find our car. We, we 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 thought we'd kind of hidden hidden the car we used quite carefully, but they managed to. Uh, I mean, ironically, they used a tracker dog to find where the where our car was. And I think because we 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 kind of um, we banked on them not finding the car. In the car, there was a lot of evidence of other stuff that we that we'd done, and they kind of used that to charge us with other, you know, um, with, with, with damage at other places, and that's why we were, you know, I ended up with, with, with quite a few charges against me for different, you know, different premises, and we we ended up both of us were sentenced to three years imprisonment. Of which we, we we only served a year because we'd never been in prison before, so we were we were kind of let out early from that sentence. But we were in we were in prison for a year for that. Would, would you mind telling the story about uh, the arson? At, uh, it was in Milton Keynes. Uh, yes, that, that was that was the one where the it was a um, a laboratory that was being built, mm -hmm. and basically um, what happened was. Because myself and um, the, the other guy that got caught with me, um, uh, Cliff Goodman, we were we, we were in the hunt saboteurs, and I think we'd been out one, one Saturday. We'd been out um, trying to stop the local hunt there from catching foxes. We'd been you know involved in the hunt saboteurs, and we were on our way home. We thought, well, let's go and have a look at this laboratory and see what what's happening with it. And we got there, and the, the you know the builders were just leaving. And we happened to have um, um, a gallon of petrol, gasoline, you'd call it, in the back of our um, our car. So I thought, well, why not? Why not? Let's go now and try to set fire. <laughs> there was like um, there were there were there was a like the tall main building, and there was an annex next to it. And we thought, well, we haven't got enough, you know, of this petrol to 
to pour everywhere. So he thought if we concentrate on the annex and pour loads there, then that'll catch fire and then that'll spread to the rest of the building. That was our, you know, our theory anyway. So that's what we did. And then, you know, as we left the place, sort of the big, big fire, we thought, great, you know, this is really, you know, taken hold. But the, the, the problem is it was, it was really the, 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 the petrol that was burning and not, <laughs> not really much else. And then I looked in the, I got the local newspaper for that area. Um, and, and we, um, um, we kind of, um, we, we didn't, we didn't tell anyone we'd, 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 we'd done this. We wanted to see what the effect was. And I got the local newspaper and, and the paper reported that there'd been a fire at this building. They didn't know the cause of it. They, they thought that it may have been a, a homeless person who was, who'd kind of decided to sleep in the building and had kind of dropped a cigarette or something. That was their kind of theory. <laughs> <laughs> And but it hadn't it hadn't destroyed it, it done um, I, I I suppose what, what, uh, what was it that that happened been done to it maybe about forty thousand dollars worth of damage to the place it, it hadn't um, it hadn't dis, it hadn't destroyed the the building so I thought well we're going to have to go back and do it better. You see, so a few days later, we actually went back and, and we had we had loads of cans of gasoline, you know, loads uh, in about six cans, and we 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 poured it all throughout the building, and and we had this we we, we thought well we're going to have to organise how we set fire to the building because we've got to set fire to each floor of it. In the, in the main building, there there were four floors, I think, and then there was this annex at the side. And we thought, well, what we'll do is we'll um, we'll 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 set fire to um, and there was a basement as well. And they thought, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll set fire to the first, the, the top two floors, and then go down to the basement and set fire to that, and then. The ground floor of the building we'll do last because that's where we have to escape from, you see. But anyway, in, in the confusion, we ended up, you know, setting fire to the ground floor and end up in the basement, setting fire to that, and then realising that the ground floor where we needed to make our escape was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so we basically had to run through the fire and, and smash a window and, and, and go down the fire escape. And... Uh, my, my my shoes were on fire, and you know, yeah, our shoes were on fire. And um, w when I got home, my, my hair was because I did have hair in those days. Um, it was uh, it was kind of filled with this plastic because there was plastic sheeting in the building that had caught fire, and that had kind of you know all the the residue of that had gone into my hair. So I had to you know use really strong stuff to wash my hair with and all my clothes were like really s smelling of you know the, the fire and um uh i i got a, a, a friend of mine took them away and 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 washed them for me and had to do a big wash on them to get them all the smell out of them so it was like <laughs> it was it was really quite you know we we were really scared that we would actually you know, get caught in that fire because we, you know, in the confusion, we 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 hadn't followed the plan that we'd made for how we were going to do it. Um, but the, and then once again, what what we did was we we um we then thought right, we're probably not going to go be able to go back and do this place again because it's obvious that someone's gone there and deliberately set fire to it. So we we issued a claim of responsibility. I very carefully wrote this letter and, you know, tried a, in, in kind of very square block capitals so they couldn't tell my hand around. I wrote it with gloves on and then I um, put it in an envelope. I handled it with gloves. The, the stamp on the envelope, I didn't lick it. I, you know, just put dabbed water on it and, <laughs> and, and then posted it quite a long way away from where I lived <laughs> so they couldn't tell from the postmark, you know, where where the person came from that posted it. And then in, and I posted that to the, to the local newspaper. And then in, you know, the next edition of the local newspaper, the big, it was front page headlines, you know, about these gorillas that attacked this building. And, but unfortunately, the, the damage caused was actually less than the first time for some. <laughs> 
about the fact that we'd used all this stuff, you know, and um, nearly got ourselves killed doing it. Um, um, but sadly, we by then they they obviously got lots of security on the bill, so we weren't. We did go back and have a look, but there was no way we could do anything to it. <laughs> it, it did delay the open of the place. The, the opening of the place was delayed by a few weeks because of the damage we caused, but it didn't actually stop it, unfortunately, from from opening. Um, so that was that. That was that story. You know, we. Uh, <laughs> It was quite hair raising. That was in more ways than one, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, what are some ways that people can find out about the book and get in touch? Well, ba- basically, the the, the 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 book's been published in the USA um, by uh, McFarland, and and. It, I would expect it to be on sale in in bookstores in the USA. Um, what what's happening over here is because um, I mean, obviously, it's available through Amazon. Now, I don't like Amazon; they're um, they're unethical for a number of reasons. I try to avoid them, and I uh, I would try to persuade people not to buy through them. Uh, what we're doing over over here is. Um, there's a, ve- a vegan uh, bookseller called V Active, uh, which is run by a friend of mine, and they they have stalls at a lot of the vegan fairs, for instance, and and they're going to be um, they're going to be selling the book over here, and they're going to be able to sell it cheaper than Amazon, and plus every copy they sell will be signed by me. So that's an added bonus <laughs> for people to get it from, and, and even even you know it might be even better for people f- from the USA to order it through the active. I mean, obviously it would cost a little bit more because of the postage to USA, but it does mean that um, every book will be signed by me. And if people want a personal message in the book, I'll write them a personal message in the book as well. So that may be even even for people in the USA that may be. The, the best way for them to get it, but I'd say watch out. We're we're still kind of waiting for the for for supplies of the book to come over, and I think that it's going to be in blocks. You know that they're you know going to get order get one block sent over, sell them, get another block. So this is going to be over a period of time, but it's probably best to, um, I think, um, I'm just wondering where the best place is to kind of share it on social media. Uh, certainly I'll be putting it on my Facebook. Um, I think V Active are going to set up a Facebook page for it as well. I haven't done that yet. So hopefully that information will get through to people in the USA about how they can get it. Because I'd say that is that probably is the best way. And, and of course, as I said, <laughs> people can have a book signed, you know, signed by me, which they're not going to get if they get it through a, a, a bookstore over there. So, I mean, just, just look out. It's taken a while to negotiate the price with the suppliers to try and get the cheapest possible price from them because it is, it, is um, it is quite an expensive book. Um, and I think what, uh, one of the difficulties is that um, the price in dollars in the USA for the book, I think, which is something like $35, when it's sold in the UK, it, it doesn't translate to the same value in, in in our currency in pounds. It's it's kind of tends to be more expensive to buy in the UK for some reason, whether that's because it has to be sent from the USA or wherever, I don't know. So we've had to do a lot of negotiation to get the price down, really, and we've got it as low as we possibly can now. So it might even be that people buying it through – People in the USA buy it through the active, might even get it cheaper than they could if they bought it in the USA, depending on how much it's been sold over there. So, so that's, 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 you know, what people should look out for, I think. Well, thank you so much for coming on and thank you for continuing to be an inspiration for myself and to so many other people. Well, that's great. I mean, I hope I can continue to be. I mean, I think it's it's so. But I think we all can. We all can be an inspiration, you know, if we all get out there and you know 
campaign for veganism, campaign for animal liberation, and let other people know what we're doing and encourage them to get involved. I think all of us can be a, 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 an inspiration. I think we, all, you know, all of us can be heroes. All of us can be part of this, you know, um, absolutely vital struggle to, you know, to, to free animals from tyranny. You know, we're all we're all we're all part of it. You know, I don't think there's any you know needs to be any one special person. We can all be really special if if we do our utmost. To to you know to, to fight for that and that you know that's why i'd say to anyone if, if everyone just did what they can not or, or, you know we can't all do as, as much as one another we all got all the things going on but if, if 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 everyone who cares about animals did what they could to, to spread the message spread the vegan message campaign for animal liberation then you know we, we, we'll, we'll get there which side podcast is hosted and produced by jordan halliday and jeremy parkin of the which side media collective with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn.